the doctor will see you now in a Smith, but please try not to upset him. <laughs> and this is my cartoon to introduce a short discussion of treating borderline personality disorder. <laughs> I think that's appropriate. Cartoon. Okay, borderline personality disorder. Now, uh, there's this guy, the, sort of the grandfather of psychopharmacology, Donald Klein, has something he calls uh, behavioral pharmacologic dissection. And that is, you take a group and you try a bunch of different drugs, and then based on the outcome, you carve out different subtypes. So when you're talking about borderline personality disorder, in the singular, that's a misnomer. It's disorders, okay? It's plural. A whole range of different kinds of people that share one thing in common that is very uh, marginal ego functioning, but, but they have some big differences. And if you look <coughs> at outcome studies in treating borderline personality disorders uh, with psychiatric medications, it does matter uh, what particular group we're looking at, okay? And, and these are, are the four from factor analytic studies and drug studies that, that, that stand out as being somewhat separate. You can obviously have some overlap here. Schizotypal, probably the closest thing to actual borderline psychosis. You know, we have people here that you know, chronically have kind of peculiar thought processes, but when they get into distress, they can, ha they can have transient psychotic symptoms and that sort of thing. Uh, affect instability, rejection sensitivity, and uh, especially problems with anger and, and impulsivity. Hang on just a minute here. Okay. Now, if you're looking from this perspective, let me, let me go over this briefly and then we'll take a look at, at more detail. Uh, I, I, in my whole career, I think I've seen two people uh, that I would diagnose as schizotypal, and that's not very many. Uh, Probably that's going to be the same for many of you because guess what? They're real schizoid people and they don't like to be around people and going to a therapist is being around a person, right? So, so and, and, and there's only, I've only seen two pharmacologic studies uh, that, that are with schizotypal people and it's because, you know, it's hard to collect research subjects for this, okay? So, two things. Number one is typically when they come in, they don't come in and say, hey, I have schizotypal personality, can you help me? They, they, they come in because there's been a major life crisis. Now, they may have, have, they may have PTSD uh, or even more often they have depression, okay? So they're coming in treating, you know, for treatment for Axis I disorders and uh, these, these people will be, uh, you know, more than happy to take a pill so they don't have to actually talk to a person in therapy, okay? Now, because they have, it, it was probably an explanation, because they have uh, this kind of borderline psychotic stuff, uh, oftentimes antipsychotic medications are very helpful, but what's interesting is uh, in, in one of these studies, they found that antidepressant, excuse me, antipsychotic medications treated depression in this group better than antidepressants. I mean, go figure. It's, it, I, I've seen no explanation, it's empirical finding. They look clinically depressed, but they're schizotypal, so the use of antipsychotic medication, even if they're not florally psychotic. But the other side of the coin here is in <coughs> this other study, what they found is that half of these people met criteria for schizotypal personality disorder and major depression. Half uh, of those, half of them within six to eight weeks became psychotic on antidepressants. Okay, so a rare group we aren't going to see very many of these people, but we have to be cautious about the use of antidepressants because it might, for some reason, precipitate <coughs> uh, psychotic stuff. And what turn out to be low doses of antipsychotic medication may do the trick. Okay? So you said they became psychotic on 80 on antidepressants? Yeah, uh, in, the, in this study, uh, about half of them within six to eight weeks were, they were being treated for their depression with antidepressants and they developed psychotic symptoms. Uh, who, who knows why? Okay, uh, affective instability, this is a hallmark symptom of uh, a borderline personality disorder and I'm going to talk about a specific study here and let me make sure. Hang on just a moment, let me just check. Well, actually I don't have this slide. There, there was a study that was done back in 1988, and that seems like an awful long time ago, but it was very well done and continues to be kind of the cornerstone 
uh, study for making some of these decisions. And what they found was these people had extremely severe affect instability, and so they tried them on four different classes of drugs. All right, they tried them on <coughs> Xanax, they tried them on Tegretol, okay, anticonvulsant, they tried them on antidepressants, and they tried them on an antipsychotic. Okay, in terms of addressing severe affective instability, the drug that worked the best was Tegretol, okay? And, and so the treatment recommendation was, this is where to go first. But there's a problem with that, which I'll talk about in a minute. The drug that actually was the worst was, guess what? Xanax. Which is the drug that, that the patients like the best? Xanax. And what they found was, after a couple months of treatment, daily use of, you know, um, modest uh, dosing Xanax, you had significant increase in self-mutilation and suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. Xanax, like, you know, alcohol, is a feel-good drug in the moment, and it's no reason that they would prefer that. But over a longer period of time, like alcohol, it disinhibited them. And borderline people are already disinhibited. And if they're taking a drug that contributes to that, then all hell can break loose. So occasional targeted use, you know, like if there's been a real tragedy or something, you know, using uh, benzodiazepine for two or three days, that's, that's probably okay. But chronic use, then, is not good to use. Now, they say that Tegretol was the best. But what's wrong with that? It's a very dirty drug, and you, I, I, I would challenge you to find any person with borderline personality disorder that would actually take that drug, okay? Because it causes sedation, weight gain, tremors, uh, all kinds of side effects, and, and people with borderline personality disorder are among some of the highest uh, people likely to be completely unwilling to take a drug if they have significant side effects. Perfect example of something that looks good in research, but in real life probably doesn't really pan out. Rejection sensitivity uh, occurs with a fair number of borderline people where, you know, somebody fails to return their phone call and they, they start feeling suicidal, oh, they don't like me, and, you know, I mean, does anybody here like to be rejected? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. But you know what I'm talking about, this exquisite sensitivity, and also really misreading things, like somebody you know, it doesn't say hi to them, oh, they don't like me, and that kind of stuff. Uh, the drug that works the best for this are MAO inhibitors. But what's wrong with that? Side effects. Side effects and what else? MAO inhibitors. What? Diet, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you have to have very conscientious people that are going to make sure they don't take the wrong drug. They go, you know, take one dose of Sudafed and, and it blows out an artery in the brain. You know, they say, oh, the hell with it, and they drink a bottle of red wine and eat some pepperoni pizza, and it kills them. So how many clinicians would feel comfortable about giving an MAO inhibitor to somebody who has borderline personality disorder? I've had one patient that, that had a husband who was very conscientious, was a real caretaker kind of guy. Nothing worked. He had this out of control wife who was extraordinarily uh, emotional and other drugs didn't work and because he monitored things and we really sat down and talked about risk and benefit and actually as a Kaiser had, had her sign a thing that she understood about, you know, it was a consent form and all that kind of stuff and she did very well on the MA inhibitor. Uh, made a huge difference in her life. Okay, but again, uh, you know, research says something, but practically it's, it's difficult. Angry and impulsive. Okay, well, we'll talk more about this in just a minute. So avoid benzodiazepines uh, except for very occasional use. Uh, similar slide to what I showed you before. This is the fenfluramine challenge. <coughs> Remember the, the diet pill Finfin -fin a few years ago? One of the drugs in there was fenfluramine. You get fenfluramine, just one dose, and it really activates the serotonin system throughout the central nervous system. 
And, and so you give it to a normal person and their whole brain gets really active. And, and serotonin is a, an important neurotransmitter in the frontal lobes. And it, you give it to borderline people and they have a real puny uh, response to it, S strongly suggesting that at least in the frontal lobe, serotonin activity is not, is not very good. Now, who is this guy? Phineas Gage, right. Yeah, remember? Get the crowbar blown through his brain, knocked out his prefrontal lobes. And what were his symptoms? Extreme impulsivity, aggression. Uh, you know, massively disinhibited with cuss and you know, do all kinds of inappropriate stuff. So this has led to theories about the role of decreased frontal lobe serotonin action in people with borderline personality disorder. Okay. Now, treatment implications. Modest, if you look across studies, only modest treatment effects and mainly addresses irritability and impulsivity. Okay, but I want to be very clear with you, it doesn't touch some, some uh, very significant borderline uh, features. One is, these people can get depressed, but they have two kinds of depression. They have normal major depression, but they also have chronic, what you might call characterological depression. Chronic feelings of, of emptiness and dysphoria. It doesn't touch that kind of depression. It certainly doesn't do anything in terms of helping to develop a sense of, uh, of self. I mean, those kind of issues. These are the target symptoms. Now, I want to, tell, I want to give you a uh, clinical vignette. This uh, woman came to see me who, <clears throat> many years ago, one of my first private practice patients, she came to see me. Uh, she was a very, very bright uh, nurse. She was a nurse practitioner. And, uh, and she came to see me. And uh, this woman was absolutely despicable uh, in the way that she treated other human beings. Uh, she, she, over the course of the first couple of interviews, just meant, I just, she said, life sucks, you know, and, and she mentioned all kinds of things she didn't like. Well, there's a lot of kinds of people she didn't like. First off, she didn't like old people. They grossed her out because they have wrinkles. And people like that should know better. They should just stay at home because they're inflicting, you know, all this on, on everybody they have to look at. Uh, she, she hated every ethnic minority. She hated people that were overweight. She hated people that had developmental disabilities. Uh, who else? I mean, who, who's left? Yeah. And, and, and she told me, uh, I mean, she didn't mention all this, uh, you know, first session, uh, but in the, in the course of therapy over the first month, uh, she mentioned to me that uh, a couple of things. One is she, she came in one day and she said, uh, you know, she, she got on light rail, you know, and she said, there's this little lady sitting across from me. Looks like, you know, she's your classic grandma. She looks at me kind of like, oh, have a nice day. And, and I looked around, and there wasn't anybody else around. And I said, eat shit and die. OK. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you another example. She says, I know a lot of people would say this is not appropriate. But you know, if I'm in downtown Sacramento, especially downtown San Francisco, I see some homeless person, you know, they're, they're drunk or they're crippled, they're laying on the street, and nobody's looking, I'll spit on them. Okay. And I could go on and on, you know, about this. And I'm not making this up. Her presenting complaint was, nobody likes me. <laughs> really? Well, <clears throat> I don't either. And, and so, you know, and, uh, now, she's like a lot of borderline people who kind of this <clears throat> cranky, irritable, aggressive, you know. But keeping people at a distance, pretty effective way to do that. <clears throat> like many people like this, eventually, a year into therapy, then she started opening up. And she'd just been terribly abused when she was young. And she began to then expose to me that this enormous uh, uh, pain and vulnerability. Okay, But her behavior really was creating all kinds of havoc for her. Okay. Now, <clears throat> believe it or not, she's been married for 20 years. And she is married, she, I could, hard to believe, but she's married to a guy who was an engineer, okay, PhD. She called him the refrigerator. Obsessional, cold, aloof. Who else could live, you know, I guess with somebody like this, okay? And she's constantly angry because, you know, he wouldn't, remember her birthday or say hi or anything like this. And so eventually, uh, maybe three, two or three months into treatment, uh, 
you know, they're just starting to be uh, <coughs> case reports of using SSRIs to treat borderline personality disorder and to target this kind of stuff here. And so I said to her, and she's a nurse, okay, so I mean, she knows medicine and all that sort of thing. Uh, I, I said, you know, I have, a, I have a suggestion, something you might want to try. And at that time, uh, Prozac, Paxil, and Zoloft were out. So I said, what would you think about trying an antidepressant uh, like Prozac? And, and she said, I'm not depressed. And, and I said, I know, I know that. I, she says, I mean, I, I know DSM. I, you know, I don't have any symptoms of depression. Uh, I'm not depressed. I don't need an antidepressant. Said, yeah, but uh, there there have been some reports that it can reduce irritability. And she goes, I am not irritable. <laughs> then, <clears throat> okay. Anyway, but maybe a month later she said, oh, okay, well, all right, I'll try it. And she tried it, and it may have been six weeks later, eight weeks later, she came in to me one day, and she goes, John, you want to know something very peculiar that happened to me? And I said, what's that? She said, uh, the other night, uh, my husband, you know, the refrigerator, right, okay, he actually, I was watching TV, watching a movie, he actually came over and sat down next to me on the couch, watched the movie with me, and at some point he put his arm around me. And she said, he hadn't done that for 20 years. I said, I think that's really peculiar. And I said, well, how was that? She says, well, it was great. Okay, guess what? Now, my wife and I kind of joke about this. She had a vitamin P deficiency. You know, she took Prozac and <coughs> that turned down the irritability, and she's more approachable, all right? Now, this drug didn't cure her by any means, and I saw her in psychotherapy for three years, and she got a lot better. But what happened was it targeted that symptom, and when, and when that got, was toned down a little bit, she started getting along with people better. And it's really in the con it's the context of you know loving relationships that people can can heal, you know. So there's a place for this. The the, uh, the results uh, from re recent research say it's not robust, uh, but then treating borderline personality disorder, you know, it's tough to do anyway. So I think that SSRIs have a role to play. We'll do just a couple of other things here, and then we'll take a lunch break. Uh, benzodiazepines. Okay, we already talked about that. Uh, okay, here we go. Antipsychotics. <coughs> Uh, 2009 meta-analysis, 21 different uh, different studies. Okay, antipsychotics improve suspiciousness and anger. And here's uh, it's not the, it's not seen with most borderline patients, but you do have some that have a paranoid you know edge to their psychopathology. No impact on depression or impulsivity, but uh, significantly improve this, and and that, that can make a difference. Now, what you can't see here, Abilify actually worked the best, and Zyprexa had little effect. Go figure. Well, that's good because Abilify didn't have very many side effects. Zyprexa gained lots of weight. Okay. Experimental drugs. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. This is one I'm going to do a slice. I'm, I hope you like that. Okay, here we go. Borderline personality disorder and omega 3 fatty acids. Now, 2003, this has not been replicated. It needs to be replicated. It's too good to be true, okay? But look at this. Uh, one gram a day, all right, versus placebo. Random assignment, only 30 subjects, only 15 in each group. And look at this, an eight-week significant difference in terms of reducing aggression and depression and no side effects. And, and I think I may have mentioned this last time we talked about uh, omega-3 fatty acids, but these really are the main targets of <coughs> omega-3 fatty acids. And, and since taking a gram a day uh, improves cardiovascular health and has no side effects, gosh, every person ought to take it anyway. But in terms of not having side effect problems, this should you know, be a part of treatment for all people who have borderline personality disorder. But let's see if, let's see if it's uh, replicated. Uh, clonidine, again, a very small sample, okay. Now, with clonidine, like other drugs that, that are used to treat high blood pressure, you have to start very, very low and gradually increase. Because if you go too quickly, people get lightheaded and pass out. Uh, but significant decrease in hyperarousal, better sleep. Uh, so, and it's not habit-forming. You know, so that's yet another option for borderline personality disorder.